hearing will come to order. This hearing is uh, fully virtual, and we're going to go over a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or the staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purpose of eliminating background noise. Members, you're responsible for muting and unmuting yourselves. If I notice that you have uh, not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate that you would, do uh, like the staff for help by nodding, that would be uh, good, and then the staff will unmute your microphone. I'd also like to remind all members and witnesses that we have a five minute clock and it applies. If there is a technology issue, and we've had a few, we will go to the next member until the issue is resolved and members will retain the balance of their time. You will notice the clock on your screen and that will show how much time is remaining and it's easiest to see the clock if you're in grid mode. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn yellow at 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, um, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of speaking order, we will follow the order set forth by house rules. And that will begin with the chair and the ranking member, members present at the time the hearing is called in order of seniority. And finally, members not present, uh, they will uh, be included as they join into the meeting. Finally, house rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing to any of our hearings or markups. And that email address has been provided to your staff. So as I said, the subcommittee uh, is in order. And this afternoon, the committee will receive testimony on the posture of the United States Air Force and Space Force. Our three witnesses are the Honorable John Roth, Acting Secretary of the Air Force, General uh, Charles Brown, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and General John Raymond, Chief of the Air Space Operations. All three of our witnesses have uh, long, and very distinguished careers serving our country, and we thank you for your service. However, this is the first time each of you has testified before the committee, and we welcome you. While the hearing today will cover multiple topics, I will quickly highlight a few items that I would, I wanna make sure get discussed. The Air Force today stands at a pivotal point in its history. General Brown has characterized the Air Force situation, and I quote, accelerate, change, or lose. In other words, the Air Force must modernize, do so quickly, and this will require hard decisions. This committee will need to give serious consideration to the divestment of so-called legacy systems in order to free up limited funding for more relevant capabilities. At the same time, characterizing a program or an effort as modernization does not grant it a free pass. We will continue to scrutinize all programs for cost and for performance. In addition, I want to hear from the Air Force on how they are tackling climate change from both and from both services on how they're combating sexual assault and extremism in the ranks. As to space, in the 16 months since Space Force was established, significant progress has been made in standing up its operations unit, Space Force man. However, while progress has been made on the operations side, progress in addressing longstanding acquisition issues has been disappointing so far. Too often, over the past two decades, the space acquisition programs have been delivered light, over budget, and sometimes billions of dollars over budget. Just one example is the current missile warning satellite program, which according to GAO was delivered nine years late, that's nine, and $15 billion over its original estimate. The intent of establishing Space Force was to fix these issues. Yet to date, space acquisition appears to be simply the sum of its previous parts with minor tweaks around the edges. 
The Department of Air Force has yet to resolve fundamental issues on roles, responsibilities, and authorities between its various space acquisition units. Now, we understand, I want to be clear that, you know, I mentioned 16 months in a new administration, but we need to see movement. Nowhere is the lack of progress more evident than the absence of a senior civilian acquisition leadership solely focused on space within the Department of the Air Force. More than 80% of the Air Force's funding goes towards acquisition. Overseeing and leading an organization attempting to deliver such technical complex systems is not a part-time job, which it is how it's been handled in the past. Congress established an assistant secretary of the Air Force position to serve as Space, space Force Acquisition Executive position, and that has yet to be filled. So we want to hear when that's going to be filled. And I believe this person should have responsibility for aligning programs, plans, budgets, and integrating those plans across the department. I strongly urge the administration to quickly fill this position at the earliest opportunity and to seek a space acquisition professional to carry out this important responsibility. The committee's support for Space Force hinges on how well it manages funding the, tax, the funding that the taxpayers provide to deliverable capability to the combat and commands. We would also like to hear about the Department of Air Force's plan to address space acquisition and bring greater discipline to delivering space capabilities on schedule and within budget. I am encouraged that President Biden has named Frank Kendall a seasoned acquisition expert to lead the Department of Air Force and Air Space programs. I acknowledge that we are holding this hearing before the release of the full budget request, and we understand that this may limit your ability to answer certain questions. However, given the tight time frame we have to write the bill, I ask that you be prepared to respond to members on any specific budget question they ask today immediately, and also to the full committee at the same time after the request is submitted. And with that, I thank you again for appearing in front of the committee today to discuss these important issues. I will ask you to prevent a summarized statement in a moment, but first I would like to recognize our ranking member, Mr. Calvert, the gentleman from California for his opening comments. Mr. Calvert. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair McCollum. I want to thank each of the witnesses for appearing before us today. The 2018 National Defense Strategy states that to address the scope and pace of our competitors' ambitions and capabilities, we must invest in the modernization of key capabilities through sustained, predictable budgets. To accomplish this, it's what that Congress and the subcommittees in particular here Mr. Calvert, you have gone silent. And we've lost your feed. Let's just pause for a minute and see if he can get back on. Hopefully staff is with him and monitoring. Members, I don't want to proceed because Mr. Calvert needs to hear the testimony as well. So um, we will wait a few more minutes. I thank you so much for your indulgence. I appreciate it. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I do not see you. Okay, we have a little technical issue here. Hold on, we're working through it. All right. There I'm you back. are. Welcome back. Sorry about that. I, Why don't you start from, from almost from the beginning? Okay. Uh, I'll say thank you again, uh, Mr. <laughs> McCollum. And, uh, and I, I'll just get into um, what we need to accomplish uh, with the subcommittee. And, uh, and I listening to our witness today, I'm anxious to do that. Obviously, in this, this era of, of 
great competition, great power competition. Our Air Force, Space Force must be modernized, ready, and lethal in order to address threats from adversaries like China. I'd like to hear from each of you on how uh, the airmen and guardians are keeping pace with rapidly evolving threats in airspace, cyberspace, and other domains. Furthermore, in order to adapt to the changes in the strategic environment, uh, I agree with General Brown's accelerate change or lose vision. American air dominance is not a birthright. We must evolve into a new war fighting era to maintain our edge. I would hope that the new leadership builds on successes of the last administration, specifically the efforts of Dr. Will Roper. Uh, he recognized the Air Force needed to do better in bringing disruption into the system, including small business. He was able to take a sixth generation fighter from concept to prototype in one year. That's the type of disruptive change that the Air Force and the entire department desperately needs. There's also been a lot of discussion about how the Air Force in particular is looking to shed legacy systems to invest in new technology. While I support these efforts, I'm interested to hear more about how we are adequately balancing resources between future high-end warfare and the realities of our current operations. Finally, I must address the issue that is close to my heart. That speaks to the realities of risk, not only in high-end warfare, but also in training. An F-16 mishap at Shaw Air Force Base in June of 2020 took the life of First Lieutenant David Schmitz. The report highlighted multiple failures on the part of the Air Force ranging from training standards to risk mitigation and emergency procedures. Following this hearing, I want to get a status update on all the faults highlighted in the incident report. As this young man's member of, uh, as this young man's member of Congress, I'm committed to working with the Air Force and holding it accountable to ensure that corrective action is being taken to honor Lieutenant David Schmidt's sacrifice and to ensure this never happens again. I understand that under current and future fiscal constraints, you will have to make difficult decisions about where budget priorities will fall. I hope they will not come at the cost of increased risk in training and readiness. I look forward to reviewing these choices once the fiscal 2022 budget is submitted and continuing our dialogue so that we can make the right choices for airmen, guardians, and the nation as a whole. And thank you uh, again for taking the time, and I'm sorry for our little technical glitch. I yield back. I'm so glad you were able to resolve that, and thank you for your words, your strong words about making sure that uh, all our service members, but today in particular, are our people who serve in the Air Force have the training and the right equipment so that they can fulfill missions, including their training mission, and come home safe. Thank you for your strong words. It's very important to remember that. Um, I would like to um, first turn to Secretary Roth. Um, so, um, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much, Chair McCollum. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am also honored to have General Brown and General Raymond join me here in representing the nearly 700,000 airmen and guardians that defend our nation. We thank you for your consistent and persistent support over the years, which has enabled us to build the world's greatest air and space forces. As an integrated force, our airmen and guardians stand ready, willing, and able to meet responsibilities to our nation and continue defending the high ground. From 300 feet to 300 miles off the ground, we protect the homeland, we project power, and we defend our democracy. The long-term strategic competition with China and Russia demands that we focus on capabilities we need today to win tomorrow. Our nation's competitive strategic advantage relies on air and space superiority, which is underpinned by rapid technological advancement and the extension of, safe, of, of space as a warfighting domain. In line with Secretary Austin's priorities to defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork, our fiscal year 2022 budget is the beginning of a journey to the air and space forces of 2030. It, it builds capabilities 
that allow the department to modernize while continuing to meet national security objectives and defend the high ground. Specifically, we are committed to investing in one, empowering airmen and guardians, two, capability-focused modernization, three, connecting the joint force, and four, expanding partnerships. First, our airmen and guardians remain the heart of our ability to deter and, if necessary, defeat our competitors. We are transforming our talent management systems to ensure that we develop and train leaders with the competence character, and skills required to win high-end fights. And we remain devoted to recruiting and retaining a diverse core of multi-capable, innovative talent to outmaneuver our adversaries today and in the future. We owe it to our force to provide them with an environment where all can thrive. That is why we are directing critical resources to rid our ranks of any corrosive elements and injustices that degrade our ability to provide a lethal, ready force. Second, to remain the world's greatest air and space force, we must look to the future through a lens of capability-focused modernization. Evidenced by nuclear modernization, next generation air dominance platforms, our digital acquisition approach revolutionizes how we design and field capabilities to the warfighters. This budget expands on these digital revolutions while also investing in next generation space systems that are resilient and defensive. Space is no longer a, a benign domain. Our U.S. Space Force was, is purpose-filled to deter and protect free access to space. Third, combatant commanders require an agile military that operates seamlessly across all domains at both speed and scale. That is why we continue to invest in capabilities like the Advanced Battle Management System to connect the joint force, every sensor to every shooter across all domains. Likewise, access to and freedom of action in space is central to success of a connected joint force. In its second year, U.S. Space Force is focused on integration. Investments in space capabilities increase the effectiveness of operations across all domains. The result is a military that is better connected, better informed, faster, and more precise. Finally, the U.S. Air and Space Force do not fight alone. We benefit from the expertise and capabilities of our sister services and coalition forces as well as from commercial industry, interagency, and academia. We will continue to invest in enduring relationships while expanding new partnerships to transform how we fight future wars. Members of the committee, thank you for inviting us to testify. I look forward to your support of our FY22 budget and am confident that with your help, the Air and Space Forces will be armed with the capabilities necessary to protect our nation and defend the high ground. We welcome your questions, and I ask that this opening statement be entered into the record. Your full remarks from all three of you gentlemen will be entered into the record. Thank you for being so succinct. Um, <clears throat> Brown? Chair McCollum. Ranking Member uh, Calvert, distinguished members of this committee, uh, good morning and good afternoon. I'm humbled to appear before you as our nation's 22nd uh, Air Force Chief of Staff. I represent the 689,000 total force airmen serving today. Your support to our airmen and their families is greatly appreciated. It's an honor to be present for my uh, first posture hearing with Acting Secretary Roth and my fellow service chief and friend of many years, General Jay Raymond. As a general officer, I've spent the last decade plus in joint positions focused overseas and or supporting operations in the Middle East, Europe, Africa, and most recently in the Indo-Pacific. 
With this context, I've been able to look at the Air Force from a different perspective. And I have personally seen the reemergence of great power competition and how the character of war has changed. The strategic environment has rapidly evolved, and we haven't changed fast enough to keep pace. The People's Republic of China has recognized modern warfare as a contest among systems, not individual units or platforms. Accordingly, Secretary Austin has prioritized China as our pacing threat. Meanwhile, Russia continues to modernize its armed forces, increasing the capability of its missiles, strike aircraft, warships, artillery systems, and nuclear weapons. In current competition and future warfare will be conducted across all domains simultaneously, it will be transregional and global undertaking with complex actions and actors intertwined. To account for these changes, our nation, our Air Force, must change faster than we have been. If we continue on a path of incremental change, our advantage erodes and losing becomes a distinct possibility. The Air Force recently updated our mission statement to fly, fight, and win, air power, anytime, anywhere. To continue executing this mission, we must transform our force and our operational concepts, and we have to do it much faster. That's why I wrote Accelerate, Change, or Lose, to call attention to the changes in the strategic environment. Because the capabilities that our Air Force has now that were good enough for yesterday or good enough for today will fail tomorrow. Our future Air Force must be agile, resilient, and connected with the ability to generate near instantaneous effects anytime, <clears throat> anywhere. Not just sometime, in some places, but anytime, anywhere. Our Air Force is the only service that provides our joint teammates, allies, and partners the assurance of air superiority, the advantage of global strike, and the agility of rapid global mobility through a range of capabilities most requested by today's combatant commanders. Additionally, the Air Force's current ISR and command and control capabilities provide the ability to sense, make sense, and act. While our past and current capabilities have sufficed for the last three decades, they will not effectively perform in tomorrow's high-end fight. Finally, we have foundational responsibility to our airmen and their families. I remain focused to ensuring that they are ready, have the tools and infrastructure and talent management systems needed to provide the environment where all can reach their full potential. The future Air Force design advances our core missions and new approaches to war fighting that holistically support every combatant commander and benefit every service chief. <clears throat> Investing in your Air Force is an investment in the Joint Force. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is simple. We must modernize for the future and focus on capabilities that maintain our advantage both today and tomorrow. For decades, we collaborated with Congress and our industry partners to modernize for the future. We've done it before, and I'm confident together we can do it again. We must be willing to change and make tough choices to fulfill our responsibility of ensuring our national security. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Brown. And uh, finally, uh, General Raymond. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, and members of the committee, it's an honor to appear before you today with Mr. Roth, the Acting Secretary of the Air Force, and General C.Q. Brown, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, a longtime friend and teammate. On behalf of the guardians and civilians assigned to the Space Force, let me begin by thanking you for your continued leadership and your strong support you provided our new service. The United States is a space-faring nation. We have long understood our nation is strongest economically, diplomatically, and militarily when we have access to and freedom to maneuver in space. For the past three decades, we have been able to take that access and that freedom to maneuver for granted. Unfortunately, as the National Defense Strategy and the newer Interim National Security Strategy highlight, this is no longer the case. Both China, our pacing threat, and Russia continue to develop space capabilities for their own use, and they are both building weapons specifically designed to, de to deny us the benefits we currently enjoy. These threats include robust jamming of GPS and communication satellites, directed energy systems that can blind, disrupt, or damage our satellites, anti-satellite weapons in space or from the ground that are designed to, de to destroy U.S. satellites, and cyber capabilities that can deny our access to the domain. 
Thankfully, with the strong support of Congress, the United States seized on the opportunity to make needed change to stay ahead of this growing threat and establish the United States Space Force. This leadership is resonating globally, and it is already delivering advantage for our nation. I am pleased to report with the establishment of the Space Force, we are better postured today to meet the challenges we face than we were just under 17 months ago. We have purpose-built this force for this domain. We have slashed bureaucracy at every level in order to empower our guardians to move at speed and to increase accountability. We have put together a forward-leaning human capital strategy, allowing us to build a more highly trained, educated, and developed force while taking care of guardians and their families throughout their entire career. We wrote our first doctrine to more clearly articulate the independent value of space power to the joint and coalition forces. And this, this, and this importance is fully captured in the department's new joint warfighting construct. Our international partnerships are stronger, with many of our partner nations following our lead by elevating space. We have created a new development process, capability development process, from force design and requirements to acquisition and testing, enabled by a digital thread while driving unity of effort across the department. Now that we have built this service, we are moving at speed to capitalize on its creation. We have set conditions to outpace emerging and dynamic threats and create new military options working with the joint force, interagency, industry, and our partners and allies. These partnerships will allow us to move at speed and at an affordable cost. You will soon, soon see our first independent top-line budget, which reflects the importance of space to our national security. Space is a force multiplier for the entire joint force. Our top priority is to provide assured access to capabilities for our nation, to our joint and coalition partners, and to modernize to be more survivable in an increasingly contested domain. Building on the investments made over the previous fiscal years, we will balance the need to protect capabilities that we have on orbit now while shifting to a more defendable architecture in the future. These demanding tasks could not have been possible without sustained support from Congress, including this committee. So for that, I thank you. We cannot afford to lose space. I am honored to serve as the first Chief of Space Operations and to have the opportunity to serve side by side with our incredible Space Force team. It is because of them that our nation enjoys the benefits of space today, and it is because of them, America's sons and daughters, that will compete, deter, and win in the future. I appreciate the opportunity to be, appear before you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you um, for questions uh, this round, Mr. I'll, I'll go first and then Mr. Calvert will go, go second. And I, and I thank you for um, your, your testimony. Um, I want to be very clear in my questioning that the Air Force, better than just about any other branch of service, should understand um, what's involved in setting up a, a, a new service line. Um, my father served in the Army Air Corps, so the Air Force was birthed out of that. So the Air Force understands um, what needs to happen and how it needs to happen quickly. So as I said in my opening statement, I am very concerned about the lack of progress with fixing these long-standing problems of space acquisition that are now in the Space Force. For years, GAO and others have written reports about the challenges within space acquisition. Our committee staff, I've seen them, has bookshelves of such reports. Recently, the GAO identified budget shortfalls, cost growth, or delays in the GPS space, ground, and user equipment segments of the program, and budget shortfalls for missile warning satellite launch vehicle integration, as well as concerns about other ongoing programs. So to the to Secretary and General Raymond, uh, cost, cost growth and delay schedules, they are serious problems. You're aware of that. I believe that they're a symptom of more of a larger fundamental problem. Uh, so what have you identified as the core fundamental issues that cause cost growth and schedule delays on space programs? And what are the steps you're taking to address these issues? And on that, uh, I pointed out in my testimony that Congress established an assistant secretary position to focus on space acquisition. 
to serve as the space acquisition executive. Now that post is yet to be filled. It wasn't filled by the previous uh, administration and we're only a few months into the new administration. But this is very important. That position is to oversee and direct space acquisition units of the department, such as the Space Rapid Capabilities Office and Space, Space and Missile uh, System Center. Now this individual is going to be responsible for making acquisition decisions. And they will have a responsibility to make decisions on the budget and to align the resources with those acquisitions. So when can we expect to see this position filled? Gentlemen? Well, let me, I'll, yes, okay. So I'll start with talking about the position and then I'll hand off to General Raymond to talk a little bit about space acquisition. I, I, sh I share your concern, Chair. Uh, the position ought to be filled, probably should have been filled uh, you know, last year as well, but for for reasons uh, beyond our control, they were not filled at the time. So that position needs to be filled as soon as possible. And so I assume any time shortly that further nominations will be coming in to fill the remainder of the political positions we have here in the Air Force. That is a key position. I agree with your assessment completely. Now, we haven't sat on our hands. We've taken a look at that office and we've organized it in a way that whoever comes in can hopefully, you know, for lack of a better word, hit the ground running and, and start out. But that person will obviously need to influence where we go forward. I will note that that position will not become the space acquisition executive until 1 October 2022. And that is part of the problem and perhaps one of the reasons why it wasn't filled last year as well. We would actually suggest that perhaps we ought to propose some legislation to amend that a little bit to say that it won't be filled until no later than 1 October 2022 so that the person, once they're up to speed, can perhaps uh, start taking on some of the SAE kinds of responsibilities. But again, right now, as the, as the Authorization Act directed, that position will not become the Space Acquisition Executive until 1 October 22. Uh, in terms of, in general, management, cost schedule and performance are the keys to any acquisition program. And it just, it's, it's a management imperative. Uh, we've had issues on both the air and space side, as you allude to, in terms of staying on schedule and, and performing. And so it just takes attention. And so we, across the enterprise, across the Department of Air Force enterprise, are taking a new approach, a new modern more aggressive, more accelerated approach to try to eliminate bureaucracy and try to focus people on goals, coming up with meaningful metrics, and making sure we manage risk in a way that makes some sense. Because too often we overpromise and underperform, and we need to fix that. So we are committed to doing so. As you say, Mr. Kendall is an acquisition executive, has an enormous amount of experience in this area, so I would expect him to bring that to this position. So let me stop and pause and hand off to General Raymond as well. Yes, uh, Chair, thank you very much for the question. We have got to go faster and modernizing our space capabilities and delivering capabilities and putting them in the hands of the warfighter. Uh, from a chief's perspective of a service, I've got pieces of this, and it, it's a whole capability development process that we built. It starts with force design. We've established an organization called the Space Warfighting Analysis Center that's doing that force design and is doing that force design with other acquisition authorities across the department to drive unity of effort. It also then uh, uh, moves into requirements. And as the service chief, I'm responsible for requirements. By elevating uh, space to an independent service, I have a direct link to the JROC and participation in the JROC, which strengthens that voice and requirements, and we have streamlined that process. Acquisition-wise, we have reorganized the acquisition organization called Space and Missile System Center, and upon confirmation of a commander, hopefully this summer, nomination and confirmation of a commander, hopefully this summer, we will establish Space Systems Command, which is a very flat organization uh, with delegated authorities, more delegated authorities pushed down to them with partnerships with other acquisition authority uh, agencies in order to go fast, drive unity of effort, and reduce cost. And finally, for the first time ever, we've developed a space testing program, uh, which we haven't had before, to accelerate and have an integrated testing program from contractor testing to developmental testing uh, to uh, operational testing, all with one organization 
uh, and that will be uh, being established later this year as well. And so all the pieces are in place. I could not agree more that we need to have an Assistant Secretary for Space Acquisition and Integration, and I look forward to getting uh, them on board soonest. So if, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, with, with what you've put in place with the testing, you've looked at, you've had staff look at the GAO reports, and you're implementing some of those suggestions. Could you get back to the staff with what you're, with what you're implementing and uh, the, the time frame and what it's going to be doing? And with that, your expectations. Um, I absolutely we, ha will. we have expectations for, for, for the airmen and for the guardians. We need to have expectations for those who, you know, let out the contracts and oversee the contracts that they meet um, their prescribed deadlines. I absolutely will, ma'am. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Calvert. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, uh, I share your concern uh, on these uh, acquisition issues. Uh, I've been, as you know, concerned about that for a long time. And uh, especially now that the commercial enterprises, quite frankly, are much further ahead than, the, than our military. And uh, we need to understand how to integrate commercial enterprise uh, with our own programs. And I've always talked about the so-called valley of death. I, I recommend a book to everyone called Kill Chain that uh, goes through the problems which industry has with doing business with the Department of Defense. Quite frankly, they just don't trust them, especially in protecting uh, their uh, intellectual property. So uh, the, the whole reason that we have the Space Force is to be disruptive to create change as rapidly as possible. The Chinese, as you know, have a turnaround of approximately, I think we got some feedback. The Chinese have a, a turnaround of about two to three years on uh, their satellite program. And some of our satellites are taking up to 20 years, especially some of our legacy uh, satellites, which are very important, I get it, uh, but uh, we can no longer rest on that relatively old technology. So I'd like to hear uh, how the, the Space Force is going to do things differently. And, and as you know, status quo is not acceptable. How can we align our resources and our acquisition strategies uh, and to work with industry uh, to, capture their, to capture their enthusiasm and motivation? You know, and I, I used uh, Elon Musk as an example in SpaceX you know, often because he was a disruptor. He, uh, you know, obviously Boeing and Lockheed didn't like that too much, but he, he did what he had to do, and uh, it's worked out to the benefit of the United States. So, uh, uh, General Raymond, uh, where are we going with this? Yeah, so first of all, uh, sir, thanks for the, the question. Uh, we have a great opportunity, and, and the opportunity that we see in the Space Force are twofold. Partnerships with our allies and partners and partnerships with commercial industries, as you just highlighted. Commercial industry is doing in months what it's taking uh, the government to do in years. It all begins with forced design and designing the architecture of space with a new business model in mind and with protection in mind. And so we are building a forced design that will allow us to capitalize on that commercial uh, that commercial capability. Uh, once that force design is, is done later this summer, we are going to have an industry day, lay that force design out to the industry and, and have them understand it and then compete to, to uh, participate in, in the building of that force design. We have got to capitalize on commercial industry and leverage them to greater advantages than what we've done today. To date. And I would agree. Another thing is, is people, of course, uh, General. Um, I was, you know, I get, uh, you know, we're in a political world and we have to make changes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think, for instance, Will Roper had a political bone in his body, quite frankly. Uh, and he was very, uh, a very valuable resource to the United States government. So I was somewhat distressed that he was uh, sent away. But um, because that's the type of individuals that you need to attract, people who are going to be uh, smart, obviously, and disruptive and force change both in the both in the traditional air force and the and the new space force, because uh, obviously we're going to have to contend with uh, with China in this one. I, I I don't think Russia 
as the resources or the capability of doing what China is already doing. Uh, so I, I hope you can continue to, to uh, share with us uh, how we're going to invest in these systems and how we're going to maintain our edge in space because we're quickly been on this uh, public uh, quickly losing our edge. And uh, so uh, we don't have the time. So I would hope that uh, that you could put together this as quickly as possible. And, and let me ask this question. What is the Space Force doing to ensure that the that this is similarly supported and developed in the operational capability? In other words, what are you doing right now to bring confidence to the uh, warfighter that you are able to deliver today if necessary? Uh, well, first of all, uh, we are the best in the world in space. We remain the best in the world in space, but that superiority gap is shrinking. And so that's why we established the Space Force. That's why we established U.S. Space Command on the operational side, and we are all about going fast and moving at speed. Uh, we we exercise with our warfighting partners. We train. We war game with those partners. We develop our infrastructure with them in mind and have them help uh, help us uh, build that in a way that gives them information. Our our main goal is to provide the capabilities to our joint and coalition forces at the time and tempo that they need to do so. That's what we're committing to do. Committed to do so. The challenge today, though, is that's not good enough because there's an active threat in the domain, and you can't just launch capabilities without also understanding how you have to protect and defend it. And so there's this balance. There's really four things that we're balancing. Getting capability onto orbit fast, being able to protect and defend that capability, shifting and modernizing to a more defendable architecture because the capabilities that we have in space today are not that defendable. And then fourth, what other new missions to transfer to space because uh, space provides an opportunity to do it better. Well, you have a big challenge ahead of you, and I hope we have the budget to support that challenge. And uh, uh, I, I think the squeeze we have in the budget is not uh, is, is is unfortunate because we need to make sure you have the resources to make sure that you maintain your lead in space. With that, uh, I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Calvert, and we need to make sure that every penny is spent spent wisely with this budget, don't we, Mr. Cuellar, and Mr. Rogers? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Um, again, thank you all for your uh, service. What I want to do is, um, and by the way, I associate my, um, myself also to the remarks of the Chairwoman, the Ranking Member. We have to be a little bit more agile. Uh, I know we have an advantage, but uh, that, uh, that advantage, in, in, in our opinion, I think is shrinking. What I want to talk about is about the uh, shortage of pilots. As you know, the um, Airline industry takes a lot of the Air Force pilots. We've known that for many years. Um, I think before the COVID-19 reached the U.S., the Air Force had a deficit of more than 2,000 pilots. Uh, the pandemic temporary paused, uh, temporarily paused the airline hiring, but it also uh, reduced the pilot losses to the Air Force, but, but still COVID-19 hampered our pilot training, uh, which pretty much the overall shortage didn't really change much. Uh, our question is, uh, my question is, and I know you're working on it, but we've got to have something to address that issue of the pilot uh, shortage that we have. We've been talking about it for a long time, and we've got to see some sort of change on that. The second thing I want to ask you is um, tell me what your knowledge is of um, what the Chinese and the Russians are doing in Latin America. I think we've asked this of uh, the other departments. I'm a little concerned about what the... Um, uh, Russians, but especially the Chinese are doing, for example, there's a, um, uh, a, a listening post, or I think they call it a, a tracking uh, station they have in Argentina, and I think one other place and somewhere up there in Africa. But uh, I'm a little concerned that in our own backyard, we're seeing the Chinese and the Russians, especially the Chinese um, in Latin America. So those are my two questions that I appreciate your responses. Representative, uh, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, when we look at the uh, pilot shortage, you're, you're right. We've we've made some progress uh, over the course of the past year, uh, where we uh, shortened the uh, the gap by about 200 uh, over the course of the past year. Uh, part of that was due to, as you described, due to the pandemic. But uh, also, what I'd also tell you, our, our goal was to get to uh, 1,500 a year 
And uh, even throughout the pandemic, instead of uh, we didn't you know, drop down, we actually were able to uh, maintain the same level we had the year prior. So a real testament to our airmen and uh, our operators and our maintainers to maintain the capacity uh, and not slide back due to COVID. Uh, it's a combination of production and retention, and, and we're working both sides of that. We have several initiatives that, that we're working from uh, increasing our inertia in flight training uh, to our pilot training next to uh, how we work with our simil uh, sim civilian sim instructors to free up more of our uniform members uh, to incre increase our production. At the same time, we are looking at some commercial options. Uh, we just sent out the request for information that we're analyzing now on commercial options to uh, help that as well. Uh, to your second question, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about with the combatant commanders is that the, uh, uh, China is not just an Indo-Pacific problem, it's a, it's a global problem. And uh, maybe less so from a military aspect, but more so from an economic aspect and the influence uh, they have uh, done with their one belt, one road, and, and how they come in their various countries with, uh, with quite a bit of money and influence uh, in areas. And so they can uh, have uh, what I would call uh, slight inroads into different parts of the world, uh, including South America, Latin America, that we need to be paying attention to uh, as a nation uh, to make sure that uh, we, we have a good understanding of what's going on and the impact so it doesn't happen uh, just uh, insidiously and we're in a position where we're at a disadvantage. Well, uh, I my my um, I got a little bit of time, so I'll yield back. But um, I, uh, you know, want you to make sure you all really pay attention to. I, I know there are problems all over the world. I understand that, but uh, I just don't want to wake up one of these days and realize that you really have a strong presence in uh, in Latin America in our own backyard. So just remember what happened in the 1980s when we woke up and we saw the Salinistas and. The Russians in Nicaragua. I don't want this to happen. But otherwise, thank you so much uh, for all three of y'all on your service. Thank you. Thank you, Madam thank you. Chair. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Quare. Mr. Rogers and then Mr. Kilmer. Madam Chair, uh, there are several big time players in, in this uh, uh, topic that we're discussing this morning. Let me set the stage to perhaps de conflict. Uh, the various agencies that are involved from each other. We have the regular Air Force. Uh, we have NASA. Uh, we have the uh, now the new Space Force, as well as the, the commercial or private uh, enterprises. All of them dealing with a piece of space help us deconflict those agencies and how they relate to each other and to the main mission. Yes, sir. There's uh, three um, segments of, of space in, in our and across our nation. One is is civil space. That's NASA. They do science exploration, planetary uh, exploration, uh, and that's that's the civil part of space. There's a a national security space. That's now the Space Force. That has transitioned out of the out of the Air Force into the Space Force. And, and that's what we do. We're, we're about organized training and equipping and operating capabilities for the defense of our country. And then there's commercial space. And commercial space is just like in any other, in any other domain where you have commercial industry uh, that's conducting operations. Uh, we have a commercial uh, uh, space industry. It is alive and well. It's flourishing. Uh, it, it's a, a great national strength for us. Historically, what's been commercially viable were commercial launches and large communication satellites today because the cost of launch has gone down largely because of commercial launch and because satellites that are smaller or more operationally relevant uh, we see a full expansion across all, uh, all mission sets that are now commercially viable so there's three separate segments civil military and commercial why why do we need a space force what why is not the regular air force uh, program just as effective or more so? Well, we, we uh, as we mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, the capability gap is shrinking between us and our closest competitors. They were catching up on us, and the nation decided to take it, an opportunity before it was too late to stand up a service that was purpose-built for this domain, uh, and we've already seen the benefits of that elevation. We're attracting greater talent. We've we're, we're got a stronger voice in requirements. We have a stronger voice with our allies and partners. In fact, after we established the Space Force, we, France, 
UK, Australia, and Japan have all elevated space in their in their departments as well. Uh, we have a stronger link with commercial industry to be able to, to uh, better capitalize on that commercial industry. So, so across the board, uh, uh, we have seen uh, a critical uh, uh, elevation of capability uh, since we've established the Space Force. Mr. Cuellar touched on this briefly about the shortage of pilots. Uh, now with the uh, shortage becoming very acute, what do you suppose we should be doing to be sure we have enough pilots to man our mission? Um, well, again, uh, I think as General Brown uh, r responded here before, uh, we actually are making some progress. I mean, we, we're not hitting the 1,500, but last year we did about, I think it was a 1263, and which was better than we have done in the future. So we have a number of initiatives that we're trying to improve our so-called organic capabilities. We have something called Undergraduate Pilot 2.5, which is trying to take more modern kinds of approaches to how we approach pilot training. Uh, we're also trying to take a look at leveraging things like simulators and better use of simulators. Uh, and also trying to look at are there some ways that we can leapfrog the system in terms of bringing in pilots from the civilian world and not making them go through every step and perhaps getting them into a cockpit sooner and those kinds of things. So let me hand off again to General Brown. But we are actually taking it seriously. He mentioned the fact we're looking at some commercial opportunities to see if there's some synergy there as well. It just to build up on what the uh, Secretary said, so we, we do have some initiatives for uh, uh, increase in introductory flight training, which uh, decreases the number of uh, you know, students that wash out. Uh, we're looking how we do our helicopter training. Instead of going to fixed wing and then to helicopters, we're uh, going straight to helicopters, which frees up uh, a number of different slots that can do, produce fixed wing pilots. Uh, as the uh, also described, we're co collaborating with uh, those that already have civilian uh, training to bring them in a bit faster at the same time, working with the universities that have aviation programs to accelerate the, and shorten the time that they're going through our Air Force pilot training to help increase our production as well. Well, it's going to get a lot more complicated because as the economy recovers uh, and grows, there will be a, a, a larger demand even on pilots from the commercial world uh, that you'll be competing against. So. Uh, best, we put our best efforts forward quickly and assuredly on on uh, on the problem. Madam uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, good question. And this is a problem that all our agencies are facing, pilot shortage. So it's not just in the military. It's all of our agencies are, are facing this. So it's something we need to look at. Uh, Mr. Kilmer and then Mr. Cole. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and uh, thanks to our witnesses for um, being with us today and for your service. Uh, General Raymond, um, it was great speaking with you earlier this week. I'd, I'd like to revisit a topic that we discussed. Uh, the National Security Space Launch Program is the pr program that enables the acquisition of launch services with the goal of ensuring continued access to space for critical national security missions. And I know the program is managed by the Space and Missile Systems Center, and that the Space Force is the service branch responsible for awarding the domestic launch service contracts for the program. And last summer, the Space Force awarded the launch service contracts for phase two of the uh, NSSL and selected two providers. Uh, I understand that phase two covers launch service orders through 2024, with phase three likely to begin in 2025. And during our recent conversation, you mentioned that the Space Force is currently doing research to inform phase three specific. So I guess I have three questions here. One, is the team evaluating the benefits of selecting more than two providers for phase three? And uh, two, as the NSSL missions become more frequent and diverse, do two providers afford you enough launch, launch options? And then finally, I know the Air and Space Forces have used a streamlined acquisition strategy to reduce NSSL uh, launch costs. Do you think adding another provider for phase three could reduce uh, costs further? Well, first of all, uh, it was great talking with you on the phone. I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this again with you. Um, we have three priorities in launch. First is assured access to space. It's a nationally critical, net, it's a national imperative. The second is to increase competition. And what we've seen over the course of the last uh, 
uh, eight or so years of that increased competition has, has saved about $7 billion uh, out of the national security space launch uh, budgets. Uh, and then the third is to get off the RD-180 engine, which is a Russian engine. That, that strategy is, is, is going very well. We have assured access. We have increased competition. The costs have gone down, and we will be off the RD-180 engine and, and won't even have to buy anywhere near as many as we were allowed to buy. So that's going well. Uh, we've started investing some dollars in uh, some technology maturation, if you will, for a Phase 3. Uh, we are just in the very early stages of those Phase 2 launches, and as we, as we progress towards the timeline when we'd have to make that decision, we'll look at what the launch industry looks like. We'll look at what the, the manifest, the projected manifest, if you will, uh, for the numbers of launches uh, that will have to be uh, launched, and then we'll make that decision at, at that time. I am all for competition, and if the manifest uh, shows that we need additional uh, uh, providers, we'll do that. General, I, I also wanted to touch on during um, our conversation earlier this week, you mentioned that uh, inv advances in technology have also allowed greater access to space and a, a dramatic increase of satellites in orbit. You know, obviously this increase in objects in orbit poses some risk to space activities in the national security and defense and commercial and civil sectors. The main concern now is congestion in low Earth orbit. Uh, but in the near future, we may be faced with increased conjection in lunar orbit too. The, Space Force, it seems, can be a leader in resolving some of these issues associated with space congestion. Uh, you mentioned to me that you're in communication with other countries who are interested in partnering with the U.S. as, as we sort of forge some of these policies collectively. So are there currently internationally agreed to kind of rules of the road for space activities in low Earth orbit? And are there are, are those rules governing the deorbiting of, of satellites and the removal of spent rockets to declutter uh, low Earth orbit? And, and finally, what, what measures are the, space for, are, are the Space Force pursuing in that arena? Thanks. It's clear that space is contested, congested, and competitive. And on the congested side, uh, we track about 30-something thousand objects, 30,000 objects roughly um, every single day. We take about 400,000 observations of all those uh, objects in space each and every day. We do all the analysis. Uh, our U.S. Space Command does all the analysis to make sure that the two objects don't collide in space and create more debris. And so um, we act as the space traffic control for the world. Uh, if any two objects are going to collide, even if it's a China object about to uh, collide with a piece of debris that they created, we'll warn them because we want to keep this, the domain safe. That job is a full-time job, and it's becoming even more demanding. And so what do you do? Uh, first of all, um, you quit creating debris in the first place. You develop standards that satellites don't break apart when they're towards the end of the life. You develop standards so when launch vehicles launch, you don't litter uh, the domain with debris. Uh, you, you act in a safe and professional manner, uh, of which those rules haven't been defined. And you, uh, you, you uh, partner with your, your allies to develop those. So um, we, I will tell you that, that low Earth orbit and space in general is the wild, wild west. Uh, basically, two rules: you can't you can't put a weapons of mass destruction in space, and you can't build a, a base on a on a planet. Other than that, it's largely the wild, wild west. We have got to put some norms of behavior in place, uh, and we have got to uh, make sure that we can keep this domain safe for everybody to use into the decades ahead of us. Thanks so much, General. I'm Madam Chair, you'll back. That's a timely question. Uh, USA Today reports a Chinese rocket is reportedly falling uncontrollably <laughs> to Earth. Well, most, mostly burn up, the Chinese government reassured the world on Friday. It's, it's taller than the Statue of Liberty. Um, so, um, Mr. Colt. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Mr. Secretary and General Brown, General Raymond. Thank uh, all of you for being here. Thank you for your service. Um, Two quick questions. One, uh, my observation, uh, we've only seen obviously the skinny budget so far, but I, I think your budget's gonna need to go higher. We've obviously departed from uh, what Secretary Mattis and Secretary Esper laid down as what they thought the appropriate growth rate of three to 5% was. So in the event you got more money, Mr. Secretary, where would the focus be? What would be the top priorities? The second question, uh, I'll just get it in now. Um, obviously, we talk a lot about acquisition, but if you represent a district that has Tinker Air Force Base, you worry a lot about maintenance 
uh, of the capabilities that we have. We have a lot of these legacy systems hosted here, and some of them are so old, it's extraordinarily difficult for us to get parts uh, and to have those parts manufactured. I mean, we're talking about KC-135s built in the 1950s and 60s that are still being maintained here. So I'm curious as to what the plans are to beef up depot uh, ability to, you know, manufacture uh, parts, things like uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing manufacturing, those type of things. What are what are we thinking of in terms of increasing the capabilities? Because we're going to have uh, a, a legacy force for a while. That's why we call it that. And uh, again, we're sort of uh, reaching the point in some areas where we, we literally have outlived our supply chain. Cole, for the, for the question, um, in, in terms of the top line, uh, the way I would approach the answer to that is that the top line we have, we've said all along and in some of the opening statements you all alluded to, that you know, as we go forward, we're going to have to probably make some, some hard choices and some difficult decisions concerning trying to invest in the future versus continuing to support some of our legacy systems. And so we've actually been talking about that for two or three years in terms of focusing on the future and taking some additional risk with some of our current systems and some of our legacy capabilities. My sense is the budget you'll see is, is, a, is a balanced budget that can support the national security uh, strategy with some reasonable risk, and there's always risk involved as well. And so you will see, you know, that the service chiefs by law will provide you with an unfunded priorities list, and that will, that will give you a sense of where that next dollar might go in terms of their pri priorities. But I want to I want to continue to to emphasize the fact that we need to focus on investing in technology for the future. And regardless of where the top line is, we're going to have to make sure that we make some focused decisions about continuing to respond to today's demands and try to manage that in the best best way we can. As both generals have indicated, we're falling behind. And so we need to go fast, we need to catch up, we need to invest in the future. And so that is really the focus of our budget, regardless of where the top line actually is. Um, in terms of, of Tinker and all, we actually have a, a number of initiatives to try to improve the supply chain and try to improve our capabilities, everything from adaptive manufacturing to other kinds of things. We have what we call a strategic alternate sourcing program where we assist vendors to come in and do business with us and try to and, and try to provide additional capabilities we don't have today. And taking a note from the acquisition world, we actually now have a rapid sustainment office as well, in addition to a rapid capabilities office. And their focus is on the supply chain, and their focus is on logistics and supplies and the like. And so we are looking and making sure that we're taking advantage and, and taking a look at diminishing manufacturing sources and other kinds of things to make sure that we're well postured with the supply chain. We're as worried as you are to make sure that our supply chain stays as healthy as can be. So I hope Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it is. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And, and I know we'll have a continued dialogue about this. Just uh, one more point in the few seconds that we have left. And I know you'll do this, but I just want to state it. I remember a number of years ago, uh, uh, in the, during the Obama administration, the decision was made to eliminate the reserve AWAC wing, which actually is at Tinker, 28 of the 32 AWACs fly out of there. Uh, it was a big mistake, not because we don't need new systems. We do. Those are old platforms, 707 bodies. But uh, if we had not had that capability, uh, you know, it, it would have really eaten into our ability to, to wage air warfare. Uh, so it was a big fight. We won the fight. The planes are still there. I'd love it if we develop an alternative or a new platform. But as you're doing this, again, I'm supportive of, of, of uh, I know you, you sometimes got to make changes to, to reinvest, but please don't give up capabilities that you might need in the immediate future. It's a very dangerous world, as you know better than me. And uh, sometimes uh, you're going to need those legacy systems. So anyway, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. That's a good question. And would you please provide for the, the committee a list of what you're calling legacy systems? You've only provided the committee a definition. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. Um, Mr. Aguilar and then Mr. Womack. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the witnesses for, for being here and, and for their continued service. Uh, General Raymond, uh, good, to, good to chat with you again. I appreciated uh, our conversation earlier this week. Um, as we talked about earlier this year, the Space Force announced that the Space Systems Command, one of the Space Force's three major commands focused on acquisition, will be headquartered at Los Angeles Air Force Base. You previously stated that this is crucial, uh, that the Space Force act quickly to both acquire and launch space systems. How will the consolidation of acquisitions within SSC ensure that Space Force can effectively and efficiently field new technology to keep pace with our near peer adversaries? Uh, and the second part of that is what future investments can we expect at uh, Los Angeles Air Force Base is Space Force supports this goal? So, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk earlier in the week and I appreciate the opportunity here today. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we have got to go faster at space. One of the things that Congress t highlighted in the years leading up to the establishment of the Space Force was 65 different organizations that had a hand in space acquisition. And so now that we've established a Space Force, uh, we are bringing unity of effort across the department uh, towards that end, from, from force design to requirements to acquisition. We have to reduce duplication of effort. We have to all go get... Uh, row in the same direction, if you will, and we have to reduce costs, and we have to do it at speed. And so when we established or, or planned and, and uh, uh, designed the Space Systems Command, it was to do that, to go to be a very flat organization. Back uh, just a few years ago, there was one PEO uh, for space. Today, we have uh, distributed that much more broadly, so uh, there's not a, a bottle jam. We have delegated authorities down to the lower level, so program managers can manage their programs, not managing the uh, Pentagon bureaucracy. We've established something called the Program Integration Council here at the Pentagon to streamline the processes once it gets into the Pentagon. So there's been a lot of, of advances over the course of this year. Um, we are delivering our capabilities uh, on schedule. The, the, the uh, next-gen OPIR is, has met every milestone as an on-budget as, as it has been planned. Uh, and so um, what, what the organization of SSC allows us to do out, at, out in Los Angeles will also allow us to align that major acquisition organization with some disruptive innovators. The Space RCO focused on our nationally critical protect and defend mission. The Space Development Agency focused on harnessing commercial space in greater details and, and, and have competition between those three, those three uh, uh, arms. The critical part of being in Los Angeles is that you know, commercial industry is all right there. And so by having that relationship right there next to the commercial industry, it's really uh, will continue to pay uh, advances for us. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Uh, and I know that if, if I would have asked the question, uh, Mr. Calvert would have in a future round. Um, I appreciate your written testimony um, on the emphasis for building digitally fluent cadre to support the Space Force. This cadre will include um, a civilian workforce as, as we discussed too. What types of outreach do you plan uh, to, to do um, to develop a diverse civilian workforce, including individuals from underrepresented and minority communities? It, it, it's a great question and it's a priority for us. We have an opportunity to start with a clean sheet of paper to build this service from scratch the way we need to have it, to have the people and the capabilities that, that we need to accomplish our mission. If you look at the career fields that came into the Space Force, it's operations, acquisition, engineering, intelligence, and cyber. That's it. Uh, all the support career fields remain in the Air Force to not increase our bureaucracy. We're just solely focused on space superiority. Unfortunately, those career fields are the least diverse of the career fields that were in the service. And so we're developing university partnership programs with um, uh, 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 colleges uh, and, and uh, historically black colleges, for example, and universities uh, like North Carolina A&T. Uh, and we are working to attract that talent. Space has always been a leader in that. NASA has been a leader in that for, for decades, and we want to capitalize on that. There's a lot of excitement across our country uh, about space. We have more people knocking on our door wanting to get into our, our force than we have positions for by a long shot, and we have a great opportunity to handpick uh, those people that we need to accomplish this mission, which is so critical for our country. Thanks, General. Just in the, in the remaining seconds that I have, um, you know, we, we talked just briefly about the Long March uh, Chinese rocket reentering. 
um, our atmosphere. Uh, what, you know, how do we coordinate this? What's the role of Space Force, you know, moving forward? Is this uh, potentially becomes um, uh, more, more likely uh, in the future? And what can the public expect to hear from you in the next uh, 36 hours as this, as this develops? Yeah, our role in this, uh, sir, is we, we operate the sensors around the globe to track all this. So we're, our operators are on console globally with radars and, and optical telescopes, if you will, tracking every bit of every object that, that's in space that's uh, big enough to track. U.S. Space Command is the one that does the, um, the domain awareness of warning, if you will. So uh, my role is to provide the capabilities to have the operators that can track all that. We feed the information to U.S. Space Command. They are tracking that uh, very closely and uh, will provide a warning uh, once uh, they get a little bit more fidelity on, on uh, where we'll reenter. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. Um, Mr. Womack and then Ms. Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, uh, gentlemen, for your testimony today. <clears throat> in re uh, Mr. Secretary, in response to uh, Mr. Cole's question a few minutes ago, you you referenced the budget, and, uh, and, and I believe you used the word balanced with it. Uh, I, I would suggest that maybe you use the word uh, okay or uh, sufficient to meet the national defense strategy because we all know that the budget is anything but balanced. And as a former chairman of the House Budget Committee, I'd be remiss if I didn't point that out because I still consider the deficit and the debt on this country more so now than ever before to be an existential threat uh, to national security, primarily because of the fact that this Congress has not had any appetite at all to get control of mandatory spending which continues to put the discretionary budget under uh, intense uh, pressure. And, uh, and, I, and I regret that. And it's obviously forcing a lot of hard decisions and uh, increasing some risk. General Brown, good to be with you today. I had a question about the NCAA tournament and the Razorbacks in Texas Tech, but I'm not going to get into much there uh, on, on that. But uh, guns up, General, and uh, thank you for your service. I want to Ask my question about the Minuteman 3 rocket system. It's uh, already extended service life is uh, coming up in the near future. Uh, there are some out there that feel we can just do another service life extension program uh, rather than buying new. Uh, we know that any SLEP would be extremely costly and will only keep the current capabilities. And then yesterday, the 576 Flight Test Squadron at Vandenberg was forced to ground aboard an unarmed uh, Minuteman III that was about to be test fired. So can you describe for the committee how another SLEP, even if it was cost effective, would endanger the credibility of a very important ground-based deterrent that, we're, uh, that we've been proud of all these years? Well, well thank you, Representative Womack, and appreciate uh, recognizing the, uh, the Red Raiders there. Um, what I look at, for, you know, particularly for our nuclear portfolio, it's got to be uh, safe, secure, reliable, and deter. And one of the key aspects I look at is, uh, uh, is also with that is the threat and deterrence that value of our, our nuclear portfolio as I look at the Russia's modernized and China continues to uh, build its capability. When I think about the Miniman 3, uh, as you described, um, it's already um, pr probably 40 years past its initial service life. And to life extend it, you'd only be able to extend it for a short period of time. And the challenge we have now is that you have uh, um, not just the missile, which you'd have to go back and do the propellant. You don't have vendors to uh, redo the parts, um, and you basically have to re -engine, you know, reverse engineer the parts, uh, and so very few ways to maintain it. On, on top of that, the infrastructure that it's in is, was built back in the 1960s. And so with the uh, 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 GBSD, the uh, uh, ground-based strategic deterrent, what you will get then is something that's more safe, more secure, more reliable, and then also uh, paces the threat we're up against to provide that deterrence value the uh, reason why we actually have the ICBMs in the first place is to provide that, that nuclear and strategic deterrence. And so it's important that we, uh, uh, we do modernize the, that aspect um, uh, of our uh, the nuclear portfolio with the other parts of the portfolio. But that's the reason why, um, because it's going to deter for one, but it's going to be more safe, secure, and reliable at, uh, for number two. General Raymond, um, we heard from General Hokanson, uh, Chief of the Guard Bureau, on Tuesday, and he mentioned that you would be meeting to discuss formation of Space Force Reserves uh, and a Space Guard. Uh, can you tell how those discussions are going? 
and when you expect to meet with Secretary Austin regarding the way ahead for these components of the service and how vital they would be? Yes, sir. For 25 years, the Air National Guard and the Air Force Reserve have provided critical space capabilities to our nation. They operate in seven different uh, states in one territory. They, they conduct space electronic warfare missions, uh, command and control missions, intelligence missions, uh, missile warning missions. And so um, when the law was passed that established the United States Space Force, Congress gave us a homework assignment and said, hey, why don't you go out and study how best to integrate these capabilities into a service that's purpose-built for space that needs to go fast. And so we've completed that, that study. We've done that in partnership with the National Guard and the, and the Air Force Reserve. Uh, we have put together our, our uh, proposal. The Secretary of the Air Force has signed that proposal. Uh, we are uh, waiting uh, to get on the calendar with Secretary Austin. I imagine that will happen in, in a matter of days. And then once that uh, report is blessed, it will be submitted through OMB to Congress. So we're excited where we landed. We, we Space National or Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve are critical to us in the past, and they're going to remain critical to us in the future. Thank you, General. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Romack. Interesting question. Um, Ms. Bustos and then Mr. Adderholt. All righty. Thank you, Chairwoman McCollum. And I also want to thank uh, Ranking Member Calvert for this important hearing that you're holding today. Uh, General Brown, General Raymond, Acting Secretary Roth, thank you for your service. Thank you for your leadership. Um, we, of course, have not seen the President's budget request, but I know that you all have your work cut out for you in balancing the readiness for today's fight and modernization to deter future threats. Uh, General Brown, I, I agree in what you said earlier, that we have to accelerate change or lose, uh, but we can't ignore the threats that are immediately in front of us. I'm, I'm not the only member on this subcommittee that really is deeply concerned with the Air Force's plans to decrease our military's flexibility and responsiveness to decrease the number of our tactical airlift workhorses in the inventory, the C-130s of our Air National Guard. Um, I'm very, very proud to be able to represent the citizen airmen of the 182nd Airlift Wing in Peoria. Uh, these Illinoisans consi consistently provide the highest mission capable rates in the entire Air National Guard C-130 community. Very proud of that. But they're concerned the Air Force is going to ask them to park their aircraft in the boneyard while the Air Force continues to seek divestment over modernization. Uh, the, the 2018 Mobility Capabilities and Requirement Study said we need 300 C-130s to meet the National Defense Strategy. Um, the Air Force says we need 255. Um, now we hear that the newest study that's not yet released has changed the recommendation to match the Air Force's request of 255. Um, my feeling, uh, this doesn't make any sense considering where we are now as compared to 2018. We, we're uh, demobilizing from Afghanistan. We continue to respond to massive wildfires, to floods, to hurricanes, tornadoes. Our nation is reeling with the response to civil unrest. And we've got the National Guard standing watch over the nation's capital. So um, in, in more than half of the 26,000 National Guard members who responded to the attacks on January 6th, came to Washington, D.C. on no notice in the Air National Guard mobility aircraft. So to quote the chief of the National Guard Bureau, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. So my question, uh, my office has been briefed that no national Air National Guard wings will lose their C-130s involuntarily. Acting Secretary Roth and General Brown, could you please confirm for this subcommittee that this is the case, that no Air National Guard wing will involuntarily lose their C-130s. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the question. And uh, 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 you also, the, uh, the fact of what our Air National Guard uh, uh, contributes, uh, not only here in the homeland, but uh, all around the world uh, with our C-130s and, and every, all the other mission sets that, the, that they use. Uh, as you described, the, the analysis that the, has gone on between uh, the mobility capability uh, uh, readiness study that was done back in 2018, as well as the one that's uh, ongoing right now, uh, does look at numbers, but I also look at the uh, capability between both our C-130Js and our C-130Hs. And our intent as we work through this is to work very closely with the Air National Guard um, as we uh, make decisions whether C-130s, are there any, any other platform uh, to ensure we are doing a, you know, a good analysis with the uh, uh, 
General Hokanson, as well as our Director of the International Guard and with the, uh, the Adjutant Generals of each of the states as we work through the process of uh, going forward. Our intent, to the best of our ability, is to uh, ensure that we uh, uh, work with the uh, Guard to, so they have the capability as we look at the C-130 as well. Uh, but as I, we said earlier, we do have to make some tough decisions, and, and I want to be able to do is commit that we're going to work very closely with the Guard uh, as we start to make decisions going forward with, with our C-130s. And the other thing that I would add to that, and, and it's not so much that we would guarantee a particular C-130, but we do not intend to close any units. And so if, in fact, C-130s were to move, we would look at other missions and other capabilities. And an example of that just very recently is down in Montgomery, Alabama, lost their C-130 mission, and we very quickly have identified them, uh, given them a mission as a training site for our newest helicopter, the MH-139. So again, we will, we will work very hard to make sure uh, that no units get closed and we will look for other capabilities or other missions for those units to do. Okay, I, I had a follow-up question, but with 15 seconds left, I won't have the time to ask that. Um, but I, again, I want to commend our um, airmen out of uh, the 182nd in Peoria. They've just done remarkable work, and I, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we're fighting for them. And uh, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. We are very proud of our Air Guard and Reserves all over the country. Um, Mr. Adderholt and then Ms. Kirkpatrick. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you all for your service and for appearing uh, today to, uh, for this hearing to help us uh, prepare for the 22 budget process. Uh, there are a lot of important topics and programs today that uh, we discussed. And um, I uh, want to have two or three questions about the space operations. Um, Acting Secretary Raw, uh, let me address the first one to you. As, as you know, there is much anticipation regarding the sitting of the uh, Space Command. And it's been my privilege in 1997 to represent uh, uh, District 4 in North Alabama, which is adjacent to Redstone Arsenal, located in District 5. Um, with over 20 years of uh, visits from uh, personnel there and having worked with many commands located there at Redstone. Um, I'm not surprised that uh, not once but twice Alabama has done very well in terms of Air Force reviews conducted to select the best site for the Space Command. Building, sustaining, and, ex and expanding the uh, Space Force will be a long-term process. Alabama offers very favorable budget profile, as you know, what some persons around the country may be surprised at regarding Redstone, but of course is not a mystery to the review team, is the large number of military, government, civil personnel, and private sector persons who have outstanding experience and knowledge regarding space operations. My question, uh, Secretary Roth, is I believe the reviews uh, by the Inspector General's Office and the G GAO will clarify what has been muddled of uh, somewhat in the press. Do you have any idea of when those reviews may be concluded? Um, I do not have a time frame uh, when they will conclude. And let me come back to it. Let me, let me be clear on what the decision is that's been made. We identified, as you indicated, because we went through our strategic basing process, we identified Huntsville as our preferred location. And so what we have embarked on now is the legally required environmental review, which will take, pl which will take place over the next year or so and will be concluded sometime in mid to late 2022. And at that point, given whatever the results are of the environmental uh, review, we will make then the final decision concerning Huntsville. But for the time being, as you indicated, Huntsville is the preferred location based on our strategic basing process. Both the General Accounting Office and the DODIG are, are reviewing our decision-making process, and they are on, engaged as we speak. I don't have particularly a time frame. I understand the DODIG may finish by the fall of this year, and I don't have a good feel for when GAO. I'm, I understand that they'll probably take a bit longer, but uh, the DODIG in particular, I think, is intending to wrap up their review by the fall of, of this year. 
And, uh, you know, my next question should follow up. Do you, do you still have confidence in the thoroughness and the methodology of the work that's done there by the Air Force Review Team? Yes, absolutely. My, my approach to this was, frankly, to invite outside review. Okay, I think we have been we have done the strategic basing process since 2009. Is it has withstood outside review? We think it's an analytically uh, based process, uh, and so I'm happy to have them come review. We are cooperating with them. We'll give them all the data and documentation that they need to review, and then we'll take it from there and see see where they take it any further. But yes, we are cooperating with them. And I'm at this stage very confident in, in our process. <clears throat> okay, and um, Gen uh, General Raymond, uh, thank you uh, for your call this week. Uh, I enjoyed uh, having a chance to chat with you on the phone. Uh, I, I've got a uh, suggestion or request. As you know, uh, I serve as ranking member of the CJS Subcommittee on Appropriation. And with regards to the National Security Space Launches, I think it would be beneficial for Space Force and NASA to have an ongoing working group to track the development funding being invested into launch provider companies. Uh, and for NASA and the Air Force to ensure that they're not, in effect, paying each paying for the same capability developments. Uh, for one rocket in use, I see a price on the company website of $90 million. Going back to last summer, the Air Force has agreed to a contract price of one launch at over $300 million, and NASA has also agreed to pay over $300 million for a separate launch. Uh, maybe your next launch will be lower than $300, but, it, uh, but that does not mean you'll be, you will stop getting asked for development funds by that same company. And Air Force development funding together now adds up to billions. The U.S. government should get the same price advertised for the private sector as the foreign customers, and uh, that's how it should happen now. And uh, just uh, so I just wanted to bring call your attention to that. And uh, and uh, since commercial uh, launches really started over ten years ago, yes, sir. Uh, we have a very close relationship with with NASA. We have standard meetings with NASA. Uh, I'll dig into the on this specific piece, uh, and we'll report back to you. Uh, but I, I've already reached out to uh, the new administrator, uh, Bill Nelson, uh, to set up a meeting. Uh, that partnership pays us huge dividends, and I'll make sure that we focus on the aspect that you just talked about, and I'll report back to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I yield back. Excellent question. Ms. Kirkpatrick, and then Mr. Carter. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate your having this hearing today. I, it's very informative. Uh, General Brown, thank you for, for being here to discuss the role the Air Force plays in our national security. I appreciate the time you took in February to meet with me and some of the Arizona delegation at Davis Monthan Air Force Base. As you know, Davis Monthan is a vital asset to my district. The community of Tucson is very supportive of the mission on the base, in particular the A-10. In last year's budget, the Air Force requested and received funding for the A-10 wing replacement program. You also forecasted similar requests in fiscal years 2022 and 2023. Can you give us now a status update on the execution rate of the fiscal year 2021 funds and the re-wing program in general? And do you anticipate the fiscal year 2022 request reflecting what was forecasted last year? Again, I appreciate your hospitality when we came to Arizona. On the, uh, the uh, re-winging program, right now uh, with the $100 million for this fiscal year, we've, we've uh, obligated about 20%. Uh, uh, we expect to be about 55% uh, uh, obligated by the end of the year. It's not just uh, the, the wing itself, but it's also uh, some of the uh, installation, the engineering uh, changes that go with that, um, and the other government costs and effects that typically go with as we, we modernize an aircraft. And, and we, as we modernize and re-wing the uh, A-10, uh, this will keep the wing uh, A-10 uh, as a viable platform for the United States Air Force uh, uh, here into the future. Uh, as we look at the budget, uh, um, and not having not to have the budget quite yet, but uh, our intent here is to continue on the path to re-wing the A-10s as we uh, 
that we that submitted in the uh, 21 budget. And so uh, you can expect that's kind of what we're, that's the theme we're on and that's the path we're headed on uh, as we uh, rewing the A-10, but at the same time, uh, make sure that uh, we look at our fi entire fighter portfolio uh, to make sure we, we uh, right size the, uh, the, our fighter fleet uh, going forward. Thank you. Uh, my, my next question is also for you, uh, General. Uh, you have recently discussed a TAC air study that Air Force is conducting to identify what blend of legacy fourth generation and fifth generation fighter aircraft is needed to meet a range of mission sets. You also discussed ensuring the Air Force doesn't overutilize assets meant for high end flights in low end conflicts to mitigate higher sustainment costs or the risk of assets not being available when we need them. Can you provide us with an update on the TAC Air Study the Air Force is conducting and what you believe you will learn from it? And when do you anticipate the results of the study will be reflected in budgeting decisions? Well, th thanks again for the question. So on our TAC Air Study, it's not just what they, there's something we're doing internally to the Air Force, but we're all also working in cooperation with the Joint Staff and OSD. Uh, with the study, uh, the intent here is to take a look at uh, uh, the fighter portfolio that we do have today with the seven different fighter fleets and what is the best mission capability as we uh, as we go to the future. Uh, and when I look at the, uh, we need to have a range of fighters to do both the high end and low end. Uh, right now, our uh, our high end, our highest end fighters are F-35 and we do not have the full complement of F-35s yet. And so we've got to balance the mix of how we use those F-35s as we continue to build that fleet um, and I don't want to, uh, until we actually have uh, a broader aspect, and we are building, matter of fact, right now, the, uh, the F-35 is the, our second largest fleet now, as of this week, behind the F-16. And, and so it's a mix of capability as we start to bring on F-35 and uh, how we balance the use of that capability uh, today, also as we go forward to the future. And the last part I would add is, uh, you know, intent here is to look at uh, the study of range of options of what the right mix should be uh, as we look at the threat uh, for the future um, as part of what that study is going to uh, provide us. So it won't necessarily give us an answer. It will give us a range of answers to take a look at the threat to make sure we uh, have done the analysis to, to inform ourselves, but also to inform our key stakeholders to include this committee. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, my next question is for uh, General Raymond. Uh, both, both the Department of Defense and Intelligence Committee community have publicly acknowledged the threat that ground-based lasers pose to low Earth orbit satellites. One Defense Intelligence Agency public report stated that China will likely field a ground-based laser weapon that could destroy low orbit space-based sensors by the mid to late 2020s. Because much of our commercial space activities and sensor satellites reside in the low Earth orbit, this threat is significant. How is the Space Force working with the government agencies to ensure the United States has a coordinated strategy in countering these types of threats? If I could, if I could, excuse, I'm going to interrupt for a second. If you could give a, a brief uh, taste of the answer and then a more robust uh, answer submitted back to the, the committee, we would appreciate it. So if you could briefly touch on this and then uh, respond back to the committee fully. Thank you, Ms. Kirkpatrick. Thank you. Uh, we work very closely with the intelligence community and other interagency partners. We also work very closely with commercial industry to share data. And we're working across all the organizations to do space acquisition to design our force structure in a way that is less susceptible to the threat. The threat is real today and concerning. Thank you. And anything more you'd like to add to the committee, please, please do. Next, we have Mr. Carter and then Mr. Ryan. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, for recognizing me. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm really glad that you're here and helping us. It's been very informative. I want to give a shout out to General Brown. I'm a Red Raider 64, class of 64. And I'm very proud of you. And I'm sure our university is proud of you. Uh, the question I'm worried about 
personally is GPS jamming. And I want to talk to you, General Raymond, about GPS jamming and um, how significant that would be for a warfighter. How important is it? Is feeling M code capacity. So, what have been the issues delaying feeling of this capacity? What part of GPS modernization is the Space Force responsible for? And why does it take so long to develop this fuel fuser responsibility? At GPS, thanks for the question, sir. GPS is critical not just to our military. But it's critical to our our society. Uh, it, it, the timing signal of GPS uh, underpins this information age that we're in, and uh, it, it is absolutely critical, not just to us, but to the entire to to, the, to all Americans. Uh, when you look at modernizing GPS, you have to modernize three components. You have to modernize the satellite uh, portion of that, and we've done that with GPS three. We've launched uh, those satellites, uh, several of those satellites into orbit. Uh, and we have enough satellites on orbit now to do uh, GPS M code. You also have to have a command and control capability called, uh, and in the case of, of uh, GPS, it's called GPS OCX. There had been uh, delays in that program over the years. We worked an interim solution to be able to use it, and, and uh, that M code capability and, and GPS OCX is uh, on track now and, and, and will deliver the capability that we need. The third part of this is you have to have receivers with chips in them. And we're responsible for uh, designing the chip and integrating them into one uh, receiver, and then the services uh, uh, are responsible for for uh, integrating those into all the capabilities that they have. So it's a three-part problem. Uh, we have to modernize GPS. It's critical to our nation and critical to our joint coalition forces. And I assume there's a civilian equivalent, or does everybody else operate under the same GPS? Satellite. That's, yeah, it's sir. It's it's one satellite. Uh, I mean, there's there's many satellites on orbit, but it's one one satellite that provides uh, capability for not just our military, but for every American. You know, I'm not sure my kids can find their way to the bathroom without GPS. <laughs> and so well, you, the, the the real world is. I've been with trucking companies. They depend on GPS. Every targeting we do in the military depends on GPS. Everything we're doing in the supply chain depends on GPS. It is a critical thing. And the Chinese have now are de developing killer satellites. And it looks like to me that would be the number one target. What are we doing about something like that? Yeah, the, the actual the threat that we're most concerned about with GPS is jamming. Uh, the, the GPS satellites are in orbit uh, in medium Earth orbit. They're a little bit higher. We've got, uh, of all of our constellations, it's the largest constellation that we currently operate. And so the, really the, the, the main threat is against jamming. Uh, we've increased uh, power. GPS-3 and M-code really get after ability to operate through jamming, but it's still it's still a threat, and it's still something that we've got to be concerned about as a nation. And we've got to look at how are we going to diversify that uh, further as we go as we go uh, further down the road. Well, I have a real concern in this area, and I thank you very much for all that you do. Um, what do you feel is a is there a real threat that space might carry us into the next war? It might begin in space. Absolutely, sir. Uh, it is clear that both China and Russia are developing capabilities to deny our access to space. They know that they can't beat us on the ground, they can't beat us in the air, they can't beat us on the sea unless they take away our space capabilities. All of our other services, all the force structure of all the other services are, is built around assured access to space. That's not a given anymore. And if you were to lose space, uh, you couldn't afford the bill of, of of robusting all the other services. We've got to protect this capability for our nation. That's why the Space Force is so important. That's why U.S. Space Command is so important. And we're going to stay ahead of this growing threat. Well, uh, you'll be in my prayers. Thank you for your service. Thank all of you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Carter. Uh, next, we have Mr. Ryan and then Mr. Diaz-Ballard.
And members, we will not be able to do a second round of questions. So um, great attendance today. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for your service to our country. Um, Acting Secretary Roth and General Brown, I'm, I'm very interested in the Air Force's C-130J basing study, uh, specifically as it relates to the Youngstown Air Reserve Station. The Air Force has consistently told me that they can't complete the study until the station has eight aircraft assigned. Can you uh, please tell me why that is? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, yeah, I'll start the, um, the answer and General Brown can, can, can fill in some details as well. I mean, the basic to be simplistic about it is eight aircraft that with anything less than eight aircraft, you end up with a mixed unit. And the mixed unit is not, op is not uh, advantageous either operationally or logistics. So at the time, for the time being, we don't have air eight aircraft. We have approximately five aircraft. And so because of that, then we stop the study. And, you know, if and when there are additional aircraft that become available, we will restart the study and go on from there. Uh, but the, for the time being, anything less than eight aircraft isn't optimal from an operational perspective. General Brown? Yeah, Representative Ryan, you know, particularly when we, uh, um, as the Secretary described, it's, it's not optimal to actually have a split organization. We usually typically try to convert an entire unit from one uh, uh, model of an airplane to another. It creates an additional challenge for us if we uh, kind of we end up splitting the unit as far as uh, between, in one, uh, for example, an H model and a J model C-130. Um, not only for us, but also for maintenance and also for logistics and supply. And so we try to, our intent there is to convert each unit, you know, convert it as a unit, not as, as we get individual airplanes. And that's, that's what drives our, our decision making. Well, I've heard, I've heard from a number of you, including uh, General Scobie, when we talked, uh, and he was telling me exactly how uh, critical the Air Reserve, uh, the uh, the facilities that we have, the aerial spray unit that we have, uh, really how critical the station is for both the Air Force Reserve and the Air Force. So uh, not to mention the fact that we had two airplanes, the funding form diverted uh, a couple of years ago for the wall. Um, so do we know when this is gonna get done? Do, do we have any idea? Uh, at this stage, I do not have a time frame because there aren't aircraft that are obviously available right now. It, it, it would. It, well, we we would like we would like to get the money back that went to the wall. It's not being used. We'd like to get that back for the two, two more of those C one thirty Js, and then we can work with the committee, uh, you know, to try to to try to get what else is needed. So uh, we'll be we'll be reaching out to you on on those issues. Um, let me move on here as the clock ticks. Um, Secretary Roth, I just want to get this uh, on your radar screen and I'll ask some uh, questions for the record. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago regarding the, the healthy eating on in the military installations. We, play, we pay a good deal of money out uh, in outlays on, on health care. We see higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of obesity, and we've got a lot of work to do. And it starts with the kind of food that we're feeding and, and uh, having accessible to the men and women uh, of the Air Force. I, I do want to congratulate you because I think the Air Force is really uh, ahead of the curve on this, but I don't think uh, we're doing enough. Um, a couple programs I want to mention just quickly and then submit a question for the record. Uh, the name brand food effort, something I support. Uh, I, want, I want to get this ramped up even quicker. And then the whole idea, I wrote a letter to the Secretary of Defense requesting the establishment of a food transformation cell to focus on modernizing the food system. So you'll, you'll be getting questions on that. And then lastly, uh, to General Raymond, I know the DOD is releasing the additive manufacturing strategy uh, We House America makes in Youngstown, Ohio, which is really helping uh, on the cutting edge of the additive manufacturing, helping bring businesses with the public sector can you tell me how the Space Force is planning to utilize these tools uh, in the next 29 seconds? <laughs> sir, sir, we're using them. The, the chairwoman them? has been very generous, so she may give you another 15 seconds. So uh, be anxious we're, to hear. We're using them today. Uh, we got a, as we talked about 
uh, throughout this hearing. We have to leverage commercial industry. Uh, commercial industry and our, our government uh, contractors are using this. It helps reduce the cost of launch. It helps reduce manufacturing uh, variability. It helps uh, improve our reliability. So we're using them today, and I would expect that we'll continue to use those uh, into the future in, in even greater ways. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Member, members, we're going to be sending out a memo uh, from Mr. Bigelow about the money that's being returned from the wall. The Department of Defense is not going to be getting any money returned to it. You'll get a memo that explains why. So there is not um, money uh, that we'll be seeing that, that can be uh, respent. Mr. Diaz-Ballard, and then we will end with the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur. Mr. Diaz Ballard is trying to log back in. We will go to Ms. Captor. Mr. Diaz Ballard, if your staff is listening, we will take care of you if you get on before we adjourn. Absolutely. And we won't adjourn until two. Um, Ms. Captor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary uh, Roth and General Brown and, and Raymond, thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, I come from the place in America that first flew a biofueled aircraft out of the 180th fighter wing of our Air National Guard unit. We're very proud of that here in Western Ohio. And my questions initially relate to energy. Can you tell me what efforts and at which locations the Air Force is making uh, improvements in its engines or developing other technologies to reduce fuel usage or to replace it since it represents 70% uh, of your energy uh, utilized, uh, not counting your bases. You spend about 70% of your uh, fuels budget on um, uh, an energy budget on uh, operations and about 30% on uh, buildings. And I'm just curious as to uh, how you are thinking about uh, energy as we move forward. Well, I'll start and then I'll look, uh, I'll look for help from my, uh, from my chiefs as well. Uh, and General, yeah, or, uh, Secretary, let me interrupt you just one second. May I just know, and who do you task with this responsibility in your office? Well, we actually, we have an organization. We have an, actually an organization that is uh, installations and energy that, that manages it, that in, in general. And we've had, over time, we, you know, we are sensitive to that as well because we are by far the largest user of fuel in the Defense Department. We are two thirds of the fossil fuel bill in the department. So clearly as we go forward and as we look to have a more agile combat capability, particularly in the Western Pacific, reducing our logistics footprint would be advantageous to us from a readiness perspective. And the, one of the larger pieces of our logistics footprint is fuel. And so if we could reduce that footprint, that would be advantageous. So the Air Force Research Lab has some initiatives looking for alternative technologies and that might work in terms of aircraft uh, power power uh, plants and, and those kinds of things. Uh, as we re-engine aircraft, for example, in the B-52 program is going through a re-engining process, we will look to have the new engine be anywhere from 20 to 30% more fuel efficient. As we go to next generation aircraft, uh, we would look perhaps to, the, to see if, if we could also invest in technologies there to make the new, the new generation of aircraft engines more, more fuel efficient as well. So we have a stake in that, we have a motivation in that, and we'd like to pursue that as best as possible. In terms of our bases, the resilience of our bases is important to us as well. We fight from our bases. So we're looking for also you know, about 7% of our, of our energy use at our bases is already renewable energy. And so clearly there's room to grow there and we would look to grow in, in that area as well. So managing our energy footprint is a high priority for us going forward in terms of managing our logistics, uh, our logistics posture and our logistics requirements. And as we go forward with new generations of airplanes, I would think that one of the criteria would be that they be more fuel efficient. Well, I thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is really important. And um, I need to know who are your leaders around the country 
which bases, uh, which companies. Uh, I'd like to know where that engine was actually retooled in terms of energy use. And what advances that you have made in the service in hybrid engines, such as hydrogen fuel cells? Uh, where is that housed? Is that at AFRL? There, or do you just have private companies to do it? There is an effort at AFRL into hydrogen power plants. Um, we'll get back to you. We owe you an answer on that, and we'll give you a more fulsome answer than I have right now. All right. I'd appreciate that very much. And then, General Brown, I wanted to ask you, uh, your FY22 request for nuclear modernization, can you elaborate for the committee how you're thinking about nuclear modernization in the context of the Air Force's budget? Sure. And uh, it, it, as I mentioned earlier, one of the uh, questions, uh, you know, a key part of that, there's three real key parts to our nuclear modernization. One is our, our ground-based strategic deterrent and keeping the design of that on track. Uh, to that helps provide options and, and modernize that, that leg of the, uh, the triad. The second is the uh, B-21. And that program is also doing well. Both uh, GBSD and B-21 programs are both uh, our priorities. And then the last associated with this is nuclear uh, command and control and communications, our NC-3, because the Air Force uh, has about 75% of that portfolio. So those are the areas in, in our budget as we lay, look to the future uh, where the United States Air Force is focused on our nuclear modernization. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you all very much. Um. Mr. Diaz Ballard, are you able to join us? We understand you're kind of half logged in. Um, I'm I'm going to go to the summary questions that I normally have, Mr. Calvert, and we'll see if there's a little bit of time left for Mr. Diaz Ballard to join us. Um, we have some standard questions. Somebody has left their mic on. Um, we have some standard questions that we've been asking uh, all the services on COVID, extremism and sexual, sexual assault. So the committee staff will be forwarding uh, that. Uh, we also will be asking a question on your missile uh, warning uh, satellites. And then we have some questions on F-35s we'll be submitting. Uh, as well as I would like to hear from the Air Force and Space Force what they are doing in particularly with climate change with resilience in the bases. We know that you had uh, uh, severe damage with uh, Michael's devastation to Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, what all that cost, what your plans are in uh, resilience for uh, the air bases. I had an opportunity to read the Air Force's strategic report on the Arctic. Uh, and so we're going to be following up with questions on training equipment and infrastructure gaps with uh, Arctic operations. And then a question, especially for the Air Force and for the Space Force, it's on weather surveillance, uh, weather satellites and monitoring uh, a climate change in the region, but a, um, also flying and launching space. Accurate weather information becomes very important. And, you know, I don't want to hear about the European model anymore. I want to know how you're working with uh, other agencies to make sure we're hearing about the best, the best um, uh, weather information from the, um, the U.S. Weather Service. So we'll look forward to those questions and getting back to the committee. Um, not having seen Mr. Diaz Ballard come on, um, Mr. Calvert, at this time I would thank, uh, I, I would look to thanking uh, our, our testifiers. He's back on. Mr. Diaz Ballard, can you get your video up? If you can't get your video up, we know it's really you. And if you want to ask uh, a question, um, we would love to hear it. Mr. Calvert, I have my fingers crossed and it doesn't seem to be working. Should we proceed with adjourning uh, the meeting? Mr. Diaz-Ballard popped back up again. Mr. Diaz-Ballard, if... Well, I would suggest that Mario get his question maybe in, in writing if he doesn't come up here in the next minute or so. Okay. Well, so he ju he just signed off. Okay. How frustrating for him to have this happen to him again. Um, gentlemen, 
Um, thank you for your service. It's been challenging doing it under uh, the circumstances we've had with, with COVID. And, uh, and then with COVID standing up the, the Space Force, we appreciate all the work that you do and those who serve with you a lot, as well as your families. And we wish every mission to be successful and carried out safely so that you can come home. So thank you again, gentlemen, for, for your service and for your attention in uh, responding back to the staff in the upcoming days and all the questions you're going to get on the budget shortly. With that, this meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>